thank you for having me back. Uh, the title of this, I call everything you want to know about interfaces you're afraid to ask. I wrote a paper, I don't know, 10 more years ago with that title, and it's been extremely popular. It's kind of sad that there's a lack of practical information dealing with the topic of interfaces and interface requirements. Things I'm going to cover, managing interfaces across the system lifecycle. I talk about what an interface is and what is not. I'm going to talk about a three-step process involved in defining interface requirements. Some common issues that I've seen over the years that people have when it comes to interfaces. Something that's really interesting to do is an interface audit. And then we'll talk about some best practices when managing interfaces. The basic definition system is you have internal parts with interactions and connections between those parts. So you have the internal interfaces, and then you have a boundary that surrounds your system of interest. Then you have interactions, or interfaces, inputs and outputs across that boundary with external systems, and they have interactions with even more external systems and you have the operating environment and then you even have a wider environment. The big thing is, is you have all these interactions. I think one of the biggest jobs of a systems engineer is to manage the interfaces because all these different pieces have to play together properly for the system to actually work. When you get into a real system, it looks more like this diagram and you can see how many interactions there are. It can be quite mind boggling to keep track of all those interactions and the behavior of the system is a function of the interactions between the subsystem and the system elements that make up the system as well as the interaction with the external systems in the operational environment. And so let's talk about emerging behaviors. It's really about the sum total of all these interactions. There's going to be emerging behaviors, both good and bad, that were never addressed in any requirement. And so one of the things that we do when we're doing system validation is characterizing the system and seeing how does it really behave after you have all the pieces put together. It's also a lesson when we're doing system verification is that does it really make any sense to try to verify a system or system element, a subsystem in isolation from the macro system as a part? And I really don't think it is. That's a big problem I see with models is if you don't actually model the external environment, external systems of which your system's a part, I'm not sure how valid your assessment is of your system. The hierarchical diagram is how we normally decompose things, and this makes it easier to assign pieces. But the problem here is the interfaces are not shown in this diagram. And issues with interfaces in contracting, you issue a contract for one of these subsystems or system elements in isolation of all the others, but then the vendor, how successful that can be if you haven't defined how they're going to interact with the other pieces of the system. And so this is something that, that we really have to manage the overall system as an integrated system from the beginning and managing all the interactions of the parts. System integration across the system lifecycle, but the major focus is on the interactions, the interfaces throughout the lifecycle. And our customer supplier relationships have to allow for how we're going to manage the interfaces. As I'm going to show a little bit later, the actual definition of interfaces evolves over time. And you have some things you define as design inputs, but then a lot of the definition of an interaction is the design output. And so we have to address that when we're issuing contracts with different suppliers. So what is an interface? It's a boundary where or across which two or more systems interact. The boundary is not a physical thing, it's a concept. And the interact involves the function verb object pair. The function verb indicates some action concerning receiving input or supplying an output, that transfer of information, transfer of energy, the object is the actual thing that's crossing the boundary. We can't lose sight of the real physical world. Well, I show in this diagram, system one and two, they're interacting. If you replace those arrows with a cable, and you have two cables connecting system one and two, and the end of each cable is a connector. You have a male connector, a female connector. So in that case, from a physical standpoint, Where's the boundary when I've connected system one and two with a cable? 
or a pressure line or something. And then on each end of those cables, I have connectors. So what is the interface? What's the boundary? Who owns the cables, system one or system two? And that's part of the issue is that conceptually you can talk about the boundary and they're interacting, but in the real physical world, we have to address who's responsible for things. And even if you say it's between the male and the female half of the connector, who procures that connector? Does system one go by the female half and system two the male half? That can be really dangerous because if you get the wrong dash number and you go to integrate them together, they don't fit. And so it's a lot more complex when we're defining these things than it looks like in a simple diagram. You know, we have what's called the OSI model. The seven layers of interaction, physical layer all the way to the application layer. And then the performance, I say performance because every interface requirement is really a functional requirement. It involves a function. A good functional requirement to be verifiable has to have the performance defined. And in the case of an interface requirement, the performance aspect is included in the definition, the characteristics of the interaction, often contained in the ICD. And I'm going to talk about a little bit more. There's three different things that need to be addressed when you are defining an interaction. And so what an interface is not, a general rule is the word, the interface should not be used in a requirement statement, either as a noun or a verb. As a noun, it implies the interface is a thing, which it's not. It's a boundary across which or at two systems interact. On either side of the boundary, the systems are going to own hardware, software, whatever that's involved in the interaction across that boundary. As a verb, it's ambiguous because there's often multiple interactions between systems across the single interface boundary. And so we need to focus on the individual interactions. It's important for both a system verification perspective and an allocation perspective because each interaction would be something I would want to verify my system against. If I just say the system shall interface with this other system and there's five different interactions, then I've violated the single thought rule of the requirement that's supposed to have one thought that can be allocated and verified against. Here's some examples that I've seen in different documents. A digital interface shall maintain full operational capability after two failures. That assumes the interface is a system and has functionality, which is not true. Uh, interfaces between the spacecraft and payload shall be designed to. I've seen those, but that's a requirement on the designers, not on systems themselves. It, and it's, it's written as a passive voice shall be, which we tried to avoid. It should be on the actual accessibility. The interfaces between the spacecraft and payload shall have standard labels, controls, and displays. And again, this assumes that the interface is a thing. And then from a requirement standpoint, standard is ambiguous because it doesn't say where that standard is defined. The electrical interface between the spacecraft and payload shall have a reliability of. Again, the interface is not a thing, so it cannot have a reliability. The hardware and software on either side of the boundary can have reliability. The system of interest shall interface with. And again, this is ambiguous because it doesn't talk about the interaction. It's common to see these kind of interface requirements, and we definitely want to avoid any of these kind of examples. So the three-step process, identify the interface boundaries and interactions across the boundaries, define the interactions across the interface boundaries, define those characteristics that are involved in the interaction, and then write the interface requirements. In theory, this logical progress would happen. In practice, I found that it doesn't really happen that way. And a lot of the work I've done in NASA, we do step one, we'd identify the boundaries and we identify what the, some of the interactions were across the boundaries. And then we jump right into writing the interface requirements and point to TBD interface definitions. And then later on, we would take in, once the definitions were actually defined, we would go in and update the requirement document, remove the TBDs, and include a pointer to the, the definition. This got ridiculous when I was working in a NASA Constellation program. I was supporting at Glenn Research Center the thrust vector control system for the Ares-1 upper stage, where the thrust vector control system was connected to the J2X engines and provided gimbling. 
And at first we had a TBD and then Marshall gave us an ICD document number. So then we changed our requirement to say the interaction would be as defined in the ICD. But that's ambiguous because there needed to be a drawing that showed the actual, say, mechanical connections. And so we asked them, well, where's the drawing? And they gave us a drawing number. So we changed the requirement to say it's going to interface per this drawing number in that ICD. And then we said, can we see the drawings? And they didn't exist. And not too far after that, the program was canceled. Step one is identifying the interface boundaries. You have your system of interest, you have external systems, you have inputs and outputs, and we have to identify what all the external systems are and what all the interactions are, the inputs and outputs. So like from a spacecraft, you could end up with something like this. And I have a whole lot of different external systems that I'm interacting with. And for each of those external systems, I have a lot of different interactions. I think there's 14 different series of interactions here. And for each of those, then I would do a pairwise interface block diagram showing the payload in the spacecraft and then each of the interactions across this interface boundary. In this case, there's six interactions between the spacecraft and the payload. If you take the other 13 external systems, you end up with a whole lot more interactions. I'm going to show you that there's like three things you need to define for each one. So you can see that from a requirement standpoint, to completely define the system's behavior, you could end up with easily, just in this diagram for the spacecraft, several hundred interface requirements. And we can't forget about enabling systems. Enabling systems, a system is external to the system of interest that to enable certain light cycle activities or enable a system of interest to operate. In the space world, if I'm developing a spacecraft, one of the big enabling systems is my launch vehicle. In launch vehicle, enabling the system is going to be the launch pad, launch control center, uh, communication network. And so we have to identify what all the enabling systems are. And not just during operations, but lifecycle support systems that I have to identify. And the key thing is a lot of times those enabling systems are not owned by my project. They're owned by other projects. So I have to pay for those. So I have to have a budget for their use. I have to make sure that when I need those things, they're going to be available for my schedule. So I have to schedule those, the use of the enabling systems from whoever owns them. I also have to address whether or not I can use those enabling systems as is, or am I going to have to modify those? If they have to be modified, do I pay for it or, or who? And so all these things have to be identified up front when we're identifying the interfaces. We have to identify which one of these are with enabling systems and answer questions like this. The enabling systems can be a major source of interfaces and a major source of constraints as well. We need to do this external interface analysis when we're identifying the interfaces, which external systems are existing, which ones are being developed concurrently. And that's important because if it's existing, you would think that the existing would have a ICD that I could use. In reality, a lot of times the ICDs aren't maintained well, so that could be a problem and understanding how am I actually going to interact with that existing system. If it's developing systems, then the interfaces haven't really been defined yet, and we're going to have to negotiate that. So that's going to be a lot of work to address who the stakeholders involved for each of the external systems. They need to be involved in our elicitation activities. They're key stakeholders that we have to involve in our project have all the interactions, input and outputs between my system of interest and each external system been defined. From a threat perspective, have the risk been assessed concerning bad things that could happen across the interface in either direction? Is an existing system likely to change how it interacts with the system of interest across the interface boundary during development? I find an existing system and I'm gonna interact with it and unknown to me, they decide to make a change. How's that gonna impact my system? Am I going to have to redesign something, or is it really still going to be fit for use? For existing systems, like I said, is the documentation available? Is it current? How are we going to get the information? How are we going to get the current configuration defined? For new systems, what is the process to be followed to document and agree on specific interactions? Who's responsible for recording this document? Who's configuration control? What's the schedule for doing all this? Because this is 
now a critical path until all that's defined, I can't complete my design. And for software systems, what APIs apply to the interactions? There's risk involved in all these interactions. So I always ask, what is the worst thing that can happen across the interface boundary? It's not enough to just go and say, here's the nominal expected inputs and outputs, but you have to go and say, okay, what is an off nominal case? What could result in an off nominal case? A lot of organizations would do what they call an interface FMEA or an IFMEA for each interaction and identify what are the possible things that could go wrong and then how can I protect against those bad things. And in today's world of cybersecurity, that's important. One of the scary things, if you look at our infrastructure, especially like in Houston here, we have all the oil and gas petrochemical plants and they have thousands of control modules that were designed 15 years ago that have no cybersecurity. And I was in a presentation where the guy demonstrated that someone could go outside the gate with an iPhone and cause a tank to overfill because they don't have that built-in capability for cybersecurity. And so we have to define and manage each risk at the interfaces. Defining the interactions across the interface boundaries, to completely define the interaction we need to define the characteristics of the thing crossing the boundary. So if I'm going to supply hydraulic fluid to another system, then what are the expected characteristics of that? What's the pressure? What's the temperature? What's the purity of the hydraulic fluid that's crossing the interface boundary? Uh, what are the characteristics of each system at the boundary? That male and female half kind of thing, what are those characteristics? And then what's the media involved in the interaction? I have to define all these. A key thing is, is the characteristics of the thing crossing the interface boundary are important design inputs as they communicate the information the designers need to know to realize the interactions. For two developing systems, then I'm going to have to identify there is a boundary, identify what's crossing the boundary, define what's crossing the boundary, but the characteristics of each system at the boundary in the media are design outputs. I'm not going to know those things until the design is completed. Some organizations, what they do is they'll, they'll have an evolving ICD where it starts out at the beginning of the project with just the characteristics defined. And then as the design matures, then they add that information to the ICD. If you have an existing system, all of that information will be in the existing system, ICD. In some cases, there are standards defined for the median characteristics already, Ethernet, USB, IEEE, 802, uh, and so on. And these are important for safety, security, and interoperability. And they need to be invoked as design input requirements. And the standards both constrain them and drive what the design is because their expectation is whatever design to come up with, you're gonna implement these standards. And for developing systems, not all this information will be known until the design is complete. In these cases, recognize that the definitions evolve. And so, like I said before, this is the major challenge for parts of the architecture that are contracted out to the supplier. How are you going to handle this? And that needs to be addressed in your statement of work, in the supplier agreements, how that's going to happen. So the supplier has to be able to deal with the fact that at the, in the beginning, the actual interaction is not totally defined when they got the contract. And it's going to evolve. And how does that definition impact their cost and their schedule? And so that's really important that this is identified. And sadly, it isn't well recognized by the procurement office that they need to have these kind of things reflected within the statement of work. How are you going to deal with that? There's going to be an interface working group. There's going to be an interface document that the contractor is going to support the development of. How do they bid time against that? And so when we're talking about interface definition statements, the general format is the thing being defined is our, whatever the definition is, it's shown in a drawing or a figure, or it's going to have characteristics defined in some table. I have to address all of these. So here's some examples. The DC voltage supply with system one has the characteristics is shown in table, whatever. And that table for DC voltage could be rise times, fall times, it could have a ripple, noise, the actual voltage level, the current level, all those could be part of the characteristics that are shown. 
And in that case, those are going to be design inputs. The mechanical attach points between system one and system two are shown in the drawing XYZ. And this is an interesting story that came out on this mechanical attach points. I was teaching the class at Marshall Space Flight Center about interfaces. Ares one was contracted out. So the first stage was contracted to one contractor and the upper stage was contracted to another contractor. In the deliverables for each contractor was a mechanical drawing showing how they were going to mechanically connect to the other piece. When I said that that wasn't a good idea to have each organization have their own definition. And one of the guys in the room said, boy, that's true. When we were doing a PDR, we started looking at the drawings produced by the two contractors. And when you counted the number of bolt holes, they were different. Wouldn't that be fun to try to integrate those after they were built? The fluid supplied by uh, system one has the characteristics defined in table. The leak rate at a connection has less than some of the units per time period. The commands are defined in table so-and-so. The data stream has the characteristics, the data parameters. System one printer port complies with USB 3 standard. So these are all definitions. And notice that there's no shell statements. And this is why I hate seeing a thing called the interface requirements document because people think that they have to put shell statements in the definitions. This is a real big verification problem. So these are just statement of facts that the interface requirements are gonna to point to for the characteristics of the interactions. So then we can write the interface requirements and the interface requirement is a design input that involves a defined interaction across the interface boundary or another system. Uh, the format includes the function verb indicating directionality input, output, supplier, receiver, the name of the object involved in the interaction, and then a reference pointer to the specific location <clears throat> where the definition of the interaction is defined. In a document-based world, this could be an ICD. If you're using a data-centric world, the definitions are stored within a requirement management tool. This could be a link between the requirement and where the definition resides. I've seen a lot of times where People wrote an interface requirement, system one shall supply voltage to system two, period. And it never pointed to the definition of the characteristics of the voltage or the power or whatever. And that's not a complete requirement. So all interface requirements have the same general form. If there is an interaction in response to a trigger event, you could include the trigger event as part of the requirement. My system shall interact function verb with another system as defined in. My system shall use something having the characteristics defined in. So all interface requirements, they're all going to have the same general form. As I discussed before, the word interface is not included in the interface requirements. They're focusing on the interactions between the systems and where the interactions are defined. So examples of payload shall communicate with spacecraft processor via 1553 bus as shown in the spacecraft ICD 1234 figure six. And that talks about the media, the bus is the media. It shall send sensor A data to spacecraft having the characteristics defined in spacecraft ICD. So this is the characteristics of the data stream. Payload shall receive from a ground power supply, ground power having characteristics described in the spacecraft ICD table 4.2. Payload shall receive from the spacecraft 28 volt power having the characteristics described in the same ICD. So in this case, the payload and the spacecraft are both pointing to the same ICD. The payload shall receive 20 volt power spacecraft for the connections. So now I'm looking at the physical part. I've talked about I'm getting 20 volt power having certain characteristics. I've talked about the ground power, but now I'm talking about the actual physical connections. This may not be able to be defined until after design when I've decided on the cables and the connector part numbers and the pin assignments, whereas the characteristics I would have defined as design inputs. Payload shall receive from the spacecraft pointing data having the characteristics defined someplace. Payload shall mechanically attach for the mechanical connection shown in this mechanical drawing. Of the three definitions I said, you have to define the characteristics of what's crossing the boundary. You have to describe the media involved in the interaction. And you have to describe what each system looks like at the boundary. 
in this last example, you're going to mechanically attach the spacecraft per the mechanical connections. So I would look at that and I would see the payload has the mechanical piece, the spacecraft has a mechanical piece, and I bolt them together. The boundary is that theoretical space between the two mechanical attach points, but each side has its own piece. Someone has to own the bolts. And so whoever owns the bolts or the nuts, that's their side of the interface, if you will, even though theoretically the bolt crosses the boundary. So one thing that we have to think about is existing versus uh, new system development. So if I have an existing system and I'm a new system coming along and I'm going to interact with that existing system, system one would have been designed without any knowledge of my specific system but it would have been designed to allow systems like mine in the future to interface with system one. So in that case, system one would have requirements about its side of the boundary. It would have requirements that the new system has to meet on its side of the boundary. And that would be defined in the ICD owned by system one. So if I'm a launch vehicle and I'm launching spacecraft, I'm gonna define how the spacecraft interacts with me. And then that's gonna be as a constraint on the design. So then system two will have interface requirements that says that they're gonna interact with system one as defined in system one's ICD. Sometimes someone may have to build an adapter between existing system one and system two so they can interact. The system one may be not able to actually change itself but you can have the adapter that does that. In that case, then I have two interface boundaries, one on each side of the adapter. When two new systems are interacting with each other, then they have to identify what their interactions are. They have to mutually agree on the interactions, both as design inputs, and then they have to agree on the actual design implementation. Those are all going to be defined in the common location. And then each of their requirements, system two is going to have an interface requirement pointing to the common definition, and system three will have its pair requirement, if you will, pointing to that same common definition. The key thing is that they're going to have to agree on those interactions. So if two systems are being developed concurrently, each system is going to have to include in their interface requirements that from its perspective, I'm providing voltage to the other one or the other guy's receiving voltage from me. And so you're going to have a pair of requirements. System two requirements exist in their set of requirements. System three exists in their set of requirements. In the spacecraft payload example, the payload have interface requirements and the spacecraft will have its interface requirements dealing with that interaction. Common defects I see when we're writing interface requirements is interface requirement statements that include the word interface, like I said, not to. Interface requirements not written in the form of an interface requirement. Most common defect is they don't have a pointer to where the actual characteristics of the interaction are defined. They don't point to the ICD type document. Systems fail to identify all the external systems to interact. It's really expensive to find out that you missed the interface during integration. <laughs> Identifying the interface boundary with another system, but not dressing all the interactions across that boundary within your set of requirements. Failing to define, agree to, or configuration manage all the interactions. Failing to include interactions with external systems in the system models and assess overall system behavior as a function of the interactions with those external systems. Failure to include interactions within the system model to assess overall system behavior as a function of the interactions of the subsystems that, that make it up. Failure to verify system or system element meets its interface requirements prior to integration. It gets really expensive when you get into the integration to find out that there's an error at the interface. Assuming the design verification of all functional interactions across system boundaries using the model is adequate substitute for verification of the actual physical system against its interface requirements. Failure to do a threat and failure analysis for each interaction, asking what can go wrong, what happens if it's not as defined and agreed to for security critical interactions. How can the unintended users interact? How does the system address these issues? If you don't define that, you're going to have problems. From integrated system behavior and other issues, 
cascading failures. A simple sensor failure could go across 10 different interfaces and cause the whole system to crash. And that's something that has to be addressed too. One thing that's interesting to do, I've done this multiple times, is what I call the interface requirements audit. I start out with a spreadsheet. Column one is my interface requirements. Column two is the definitions of those interactions. The middle column is the, the external system interaction, uh, the external system I'm interacting with, and then the external system, does it have requirements to interact with me? And I go through this audit, I, I see all this red in here. My requirement did not point to the same definition as the external system did. So external system says it's interacting with me per the definition one, two, three, but I said I was interacting with it per definition one, one, two. So we're going by two different definitions. And so the likelihood that we're actually gonna be able to interact together is not very good. In some cases, the definitions are missing. Some cases like on the right here, the external system one doesn't have a requirement that's interfacing with me. And you just go through here and it's surprising when you see all the disconnects when you do this audit. I was working with an old company. They have the existing systems that they develop. They manage by components that make up the system. We were talking about interfaces and the company I was really impressed with is they actually do the IFMEA for every interface for each component. And they have boundary diagrams for each component. But I ask them, well, where's your integrated drawing that shows all the components coming together? And the lead system engineer says, oh, we don't have one of those. And I said, you might have some problems. So he couldn't sleep that night. He went and developed that drawing. And he found on an average, there's a 40% disconnect between the boundary diagrams of the different components that made up their system. And that's kind of scary. The same with this thrust vector control group I was supporting. They had electrical diagrams that showed all the wiring connecting all the electrical components, but they had no overall drawing showing how all the mechanical systems were being connected together. They didn't have that integrated assembly drawing and that can cause problems. In closing this out, some best practices, you need to make sure we define up front how the project team's gonna manage interfaces in the system engineering management plan and their needs and requirements definition management plan. They have to assign responsibility for the identification of the interface boundaries. There needs to be interface czar or czarist. I'm the interface guru tattooed on their forehead because interfaces are something we need to consider across the life cycle. And the role of that interface czar changes from the beginning of the project to the end. It's important that someone's focus is just on the interfaces. And so someone has to be assigned that responsibility. We have to make sure the external systems we're interfacing with, those are represented by stakeholders. We have to include interactions within all of our requirements, ensure the interactions have been defined to the level of detail appropriate to the life cycle, recorded baseline and under configuration control. For developing the systems, ensure there's a process in place, define the interfaces, agree and configuration manage those interactions. When we're dealing with suppliers, we make sure we have to deal with the evolving nature of the interfaces. Make sure all interface documentation is available to everybody and is kept current. And then change control is very important. If one side wants to make a change, they can't just unilaterally do that. There needs to be a process in place to make sure that the impact is on the other side of the interface is done. And that's a real problem when you have multiple suppliers and the different suppliers may have proprietary stuff and they may change it and not tell anyone. And then when you get into integration, now I got issues. That can be a really big problem. It's a good idea to have an interface working group that is the focus of managing all the interfaces, identify interfaces early, like I pointed out at the beginning and manage them throughout the life cycle. Again, get all the documentation, Make sure if it isn't documented, you find a way to document it. Sometimes you might have to reverse engineer a legacy system. Big thing is planning ahead for how you're going to verify the system meets all the interface requirements. How are you going to do system integration? How are you going to assess and validate the behavior of the integrated system as a function of the interactions? Verification of the interactions may be required before you can even integrate parts.
the external system on the other side that may not be available. So you may have to have special equipment, simulators, emulators. Those are separate systems that may have to be developed. And so we have to budget for those, include that in our schedule. We have to include system verification and validation of those items before we can use those for our verification. So there's a whole lot of stuff involved in the whole field of, of doing this. I see in the chat, there's a question concerning the most common issues, problems I see when it comes to interfaces. In general, the biggest problem is a failure to follow the best practices that I just talked about. Missing an interface, not adequately defining the interface, not thinking ahead to how you're going to verify the system meets the interface, not even knowing how to write an interface requirement properly. I've seen some documents where all the interface requirements just talked about the interaction and never did point to the definitions. So how do you verify the system meets those? Does anyone else have any examples of issues they've seen dealing with interfaces? Honestly, interface management is probably one of the trickiest things I've tackled when I've been leading teams working requirements. There's two reasons, I think. One is the singular ownership really doesn't exist. So while systems engineering may try to corral the interface information, it's hard to find the dedicated teams to work the interfaces and you really make sure they're all documented and agreed to. The uh, second reason I found trouble is the concurrent nature we're trying to develop our products. And so the interface is really not static during this development process. So I, I found it a really tricky issue just in general, trying to deal with it during development. Especially when you farm out different parts of the architecture to different organizations, either internally or externally, they're trying to go forward, but yet the interactions haven't been agreed to. I think what you mentioned earlier about how when you're trying to work with another company and you refer to everything as like my own, this is everything from like my perspective and what I need you to do. I've seen where that isn't done very well, especially when you have a lot of data points flowing and you have like RX and TX and then it's like, wait, is it my RX, your TX? because that wasn't properly defined. And then it becomes a disaster to try to, especially if there's a lot of communication lines. One prime example is if I have, a, say, a Earth observation spacecraft that's collecting a whole lot of data, but yet my downlink is limited in bandwidth. Because someone shows that bandwidth, do I have to spend more money with compression algorithms? Or should we have a larger bandwidth do the data processing on the ground rather than doing the data processing on the spacecraft. It makes a difference in cost, depending on how you decide that. One of the big problems that I keep talking about is the dangers of siloing things. You and the other system have a parent. You have some organization that's responsible for the macro system each of you are a part of. And so that parent organization, the integrating organization, needs to have set up something that you can work with them and resolve those issues. You know, that parent integrating organization has to take on some roles. Actually, I would think that's the key role of an integrating organization is to ensure the interfaces are addressed within the different elements, as well as the mission and its external entities. The integrating organization, they have to accept that role. There should be an interface working group chaired by the integrating organization, and then each of the pieces have a representative on that working group. I've been told in organizations like in the aircraft industry where they have different suppliers that are competitors with each other, and the competitors just don't want to work with each other. And the integrating organization had some really interesting contract issues and integration issues because of it. Lou, I was curious, you've worked anything from medical device to Constellation, a very major space system. What's the interface challenges like when you're dealing with more smaller projects, like your medical device ones, compared to what we were talking about on the major space systems? There's some medical device companies that do everything in-house. There's some medical device companies that the brilliant scientists come up with key biological method of doing stuff, analyzing proteins analyzing DNA or whatever, and they define the core piece of an instrument that will get them the data they need to do their work. And then they'll issue a contract out to a, a vendor to supply the rest of the instrument. So your power supply and your structure in the outside the skin, 
a lot of the user interface kind of stuff, the cooling and, and so on, but they are the boss. They're the ones that are issuing the contract. So they really don't have much of an issue in that respect. It makes life a lot easier when you're in control of all the pieces of the architecture and you can make the trade-offs on what's done on one side of the interface versus the other side. I was going to say, I like that idea until I try and practice, even being in part of the same organization. I've dealt with different integrated product teams who are like their own little organizations, even though we're on the same project. And they actually needed interface control documents between each IBT. So even though we're all in the same company, I still needed to make sure we had interface agreements within teams on the project. But you didn't have to worry about the proprietary kind of things. No, but certainly it was challenging in terms of a a numbers game, right? There's just a lot of interfaces that when you're dealing it internally to the company. Did you have an interface control working group type organization that they were all part of? We had a system engineer whose job it was to corral everybody into agreements, however he chose to do it, whether it was working groups or a lot of little discussions. I've got two real world examples of how we failed to identify interfaces early on. So I work really old airplanes. The first one was there appeared to be a shim in the nose landing gear doors. It was made of really weird metal that was hard to get. And so maintenance asked, hey, can we have a substitute? And the structural engineer who was reviewing it only had a drawing and no requirements documents. So being a structural engineer, he replaced it with something of the same strength. Well, it turned out that particular material was magnetic and it helped the gear doors align. But because we were stovepiped into structures versus mechanical systems, he wasn't aware that the system that helped the doors close well needed that magnetic material that was also serving as a shim for the doors. So that was one. So we didn't know what the requirements were. So when we went to go change things, made it difficult. And then the other one was for a radar that was on top of an airplane. And the older airplanes are made of bonded honeycomb panels that are metallic. So they're usually aluminum. Modern repairs are usually fiberglass. And so again, panels went bad under the antenna because of water damage. The the structural engineer approved a fiberglass overlay and then the radar wouldn't work because it was no longer grounded. On the structural drawing, it didn't say anything about a requirement for that panel needing to provide grounding as part of its function or anything because it was just a build to print drawing. And since the design was so long ago, we didn't have good requirements traceability. And no rationale for any of the requirements you had. You have no idea why the parts are shaped like they are, why the materials were chosen. All you have is a drawing. And so it makes it really, really hard to deviate from the drawing when you need to. Those are war stories on how requirements are very important. (laughs) One that really struck me was we had a test set, a 60-year-old test set that you would do engine fan blade balancing with. The test set went obsolete and we were trying to figure out what equipment we could use to replace it and blah, blah, blah. And it turned out we were going to have to get something and program it. So we had to go back into the original legacy software and figure out where the fan balancing blade equation came from. And we found the equation, but we have no idea where it came from or why it is what it is. So our only option was really to copy paste it into the new software and fingers crossed it worked. The example you have that Shim brings up a, a real problem with especially legacy systems is that when the system was first built, there was an ICD. And then as time goes and there was some degradation, the maintenance people come up with workarounds to make a system continue to work. In practice, maybe a bolt was breaking too often, so they decided to go put a, a stronger bolt in. But they never went and updated the ICD to what changes were made over time. I think that's a problem that occurs quite a bit. That's why I emphasize in here that not only get the documentation, but is it current? And make sure all the documents. So we ran into an issue where we were upgrading an old airplane and the government had been delivered the original tech data package, put it in a government system and was merrily going on their way, making updates to the tech data. Well, 40 years go by, they decided to do a mod, but they paid the original OEM to do the mod. Well, they used their original baseline TDP. It undid all of the tech data changes we'd done for the last 40 years. It was a nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to talk about one other, an interesting interface concept. It's and why you need to focus on interaction in a medical diagnostic device. 
I was working on a project where there's a biological sample was put into a cartridge and then that cartridge was inserted into an instrument and then they had what are called a light engine that had LEDs, a certain brightness and different wavelengths. And then they had a camera system then that would take a high resolution image of the biological sample in the cartridge. Interaction problems were that cartridge surface, what was its reflectivity? So that when the LEDs on the outside were illuminating the biological sample through the cartridge, right that the material was such it would allow the, the wavelength and the intensity of the light to reach the biological sample itself. And so the reflectivity, the transmissivity of that cartridge surface was critical. And the same thing with the camera taking the, the image, the characteristics of that surface impacted the quality of the images. And so those were all things that had to be defined in an ICD even though the, I don't know what you call it, it was a passive interface, that it was still an interaction that was critical to the quality of the data that was collected. And then the other thing that we came up with, there's a danger of people defining only beginning of life requirements and not defining end of life requirements. If I have that biological device that's doing the imaging, there is a requirement for accuracy and precision and it had a requirement for lifetime, five years. So the expectation that you have the same accuracy and precision over that five-year period. But the LEDs degrade with time. So they had to pick the LEDs that in the beginning of life had enough margin in them. So at the end of life, they still met the interface requirements. They did a lot of testing to characterize the degradation. And then they picked the LEDs with the brightness such that at the end of life, they would still meet the requirements. So one of the issues, it's simpler if I have a one-to-one -one relationship between systems, but if I have a one-to-many, and so my existing system is interfacing with many, and one of those many wants to make a change, then there's gonna be a hesitancy to make the change to the existing system because I have a whole bunch of other systems that are interfacing based on the existing definition. And so that can be an issue. I don't wanna change for the one because that ripples through all the others. A lot of times with government, a change to the requirements is considered a modification which can drive cost implications. Mm -hmm. A lot of times when I'm changing requirements after the system is fielded, or even if it's been just been through prototyping, I have to be careful how I word stuff and call things a configuration change instead of a modification because otherwise the finance people's ears perk up and they make me get different colors of money. And in some cases, it actually takes an act of Congress to get the type of money that you need. And so changes to those kind of requirements documents that have already been agreed upon can have a ripple effect. I was only able to give you a very top level coverage of what's in our documents. It has much, much more on the topic of interfaces across the life cycle. And so that's it. Thank you so much, Lou. We really appreciate it.